we're going to be talking about empowering the immune system, you hear a lot about the immune system, don't you? People say, I got a cold because my immune system's down. No, no. The fact that you've got a cold means your immune system is working very, very well because a cold is a house clean. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to explain to you what your immune system is. Because if I were to ask you what's your immune system, could you answer me? Everyone talks about the immune system. What is it? So I'm going to go through tonight and show you what your immune system is. Well, we've got a protection in our body and it, on our body it's called skin. The skin is a protection. And if you cut the skin, then it's now open to the air, open to any pathogens that might come in. And so what you've got to do is you've got to put that skin together and cover it, don't you? And if you don't cover it, then um, what will happen, it'll get infected. Some people said, I got an infection. What is an infection? Would well, your pus is dead white blood cells and those white blood cells basically make up your immune system. But before I explain the white blood cells, we've just looked at the skin, we're going to look in the ears. Do you know there's protection in the ears? There's little hairs in the ears, so if anything goes in the ears, the ears trap it, the hairs trap it, and that's why we often build up a little wax in the ear, don't we? But there's also an eardrum there, and the eardrum also protects anything going into the ear. But let's go to the eyes. The eyes are an amazing thing. You have a look at it. If something hits the eye, the, the bones there protect the eye because the eye is sunken in. But not only that, you've got eyelashes. And if something were to come near the eye, what, we blink. You see, that's another reaction. And if it gets past the lashes and past the blink reflex, then coating the eyeball is like a liquid that's like a mucus and that can trap something. I'm sure we've all got a bug in our eye and what happens is when that bug gets into that fluid, it basically almost drowns it, doesn't it? And if anyone, a child, my children used to say to me, I've got something in my eye, so they go round the world. You know, you move your eye round the world and round the world and it'll work it out and it'll usually work it to here, won't it? And we can actually just flick it out. So can you see all these protections in place, in place to protect our blood? Now, the nose, the nose is fascinating. Do you know that the bony structure inside the nose is like all these little caves? And when we breathe in air that has got bits of dust on it, it ricochets all around those little caverns and the ricocheting the air around those caverns drops off any dust and then we breathe in the air. And every now and then we blow our nose, don't we? <laughs> and when we blow our nose, especially if we've been gardening in dirt, you'll see brown things in there that have all been trapped by the hairs and by the ricocheting. Whereas if we breathe in pure air, it is so light, it goes straight down and into our lungs. And if anything happens to get past the ricocheting, inside those little caverns, and we do breathe it in, there are all these little hairs that line the lungs and it catches it there. And then if something does get in, we start coughing, don't we? And the coughing is a reflex to actually get things that are in the lungs up and out. Now, I fly a lot. And when I exercise in the morning, it is not uncommon for me to feel something coming up in my lungs and I spit it out. And someone says, Barbara, I'm coughing up green. I say, fantastic. Where was it before you coughed it up? You see, that's what the lungs do. They're, they're bringing it up to, uh, for you to spit it out. <coughs> but let's go now to the mouth and not just the mouth. We've just done um, going down into the trachea. So you can breathe in air and you can breathe in air through your mouth and through your nose, can't you? Now we should be nose breathers because the mouth hasn't got the little caverns to ricochet around. The mouth hasn't got 
um, the little hairs. So we should be nose breathers. And I don't know if you've heard of the Buteyko method of breathing. Professor Buteyko is a Russian man who developed a method of breathing to help people with asthma. And he pushes nose breathing because nose breathing purifies the air. And some people would say, but I can't um, breathe through my nose. I say, why not? Because it's all blocked up. What's my next question? We haven't had the why yet. You see, uh, Newton's third law of motion, to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There is always a reason. Why is your nose blocked up? Well, there's all this mucus there. What's my next question? Why is there mucus there? And the person says, I don't know. The most common reason, or the most, you know, the most reason that there is mucus in the eustachian tubes is an intolerance to gluten. You see, not only was the starch structure changed in the hybridization of the wheat, the, the gluten structure was changed. Let me show you. So the wheat that God made is encorn. And the gluten structure of glen encorn is very fragile very fragile protein or gluten structure. It is not sure when, a couple of thousand years ago, Encorn did a, a wild hybrid with a field grass and came up with the Emma strain of wheat. The Emma strain of wheat has a little bit more complex protein or gluten structure. Not as fragile as Encorn, but fairly fragile. Fragile is important because fragile means that the um, grinding process, the cooking process, the chewing process, the digestive enzyme easily breaks it down and it's very easy to digest as you'll see on Friday night when we go on our journey through the gut. In the 1950s a group of scientists put the Emma form of wheat through intensive crossbreeding but what was never addressed was the effect on the body especially the effect on the gut and other parts of the body. The hybridization of this wheat created an incredibly complex brute protein or gluten structure. It's almost only a cast iron gut that can break that down and there aren't many cast iron guts today. Whereas spelt and kamut, they both have retained that fairly fragile structure. Now if that hybridized wheat is made into a sourdough bread, the sourdough bread is a cultured bread and that bread particularly breaks down the protein or the gluten structure of the wheat. And so the sourdough bread or the sourdough wheat is now a much le less complex protein structure. Now, if you make spelt or kamut into a sourdough bread, and basically the sourdough is just the way the bread is made or risen, you can bring the spelt and kamut back to the very fragile encorn structure. That's why the sourdough bread is superior, because it is a cultured bread that basically just about pre-digests your grain. Now, if a person has an intolerance to the to the wheat, and many do, one of the reactions is excess mucus is created. And that excess mucus is sitting in the eustachian tubes. Also, if a person cannot handle dairy products, that can also create excess mucus in the eustachian tubes. So if someone has excess mucus and can't th breathe through their nose, my suggestion is to stop the wheat. In fact, I could almost have an answering service on my phone. Stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. Next! Stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. <laughs> now you can eat a slice of bread and it'll be out of your body in 24 hours, but the effect can remain for up to two months. So it's a bit of patience there. <laughs> You've got to um, wait for, for that to be out of the body. So, back to our nose breathing. And that's also your um, sleep apnea machine. 
Um, a lot of people need that because of mucus that's up in here. There's a question, can you get off the sleep apnea machine? You can when you stop the wheat and you can when you lose weight. How do you lose weight? Ah, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. How can you clean up the mucus in the eustachian tubes? Ah, stop the wheat, dairy, and fried sugar. I could just have a recorder here and keep pushing it, couldn't I? <laughs> Is it that simple? Well, just about. <laughs> just about. How do you know if you've got an intolerance to? Ah, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. <laughs> Watch and wait and see what happens. Okay, we're coming back to our going through the mouth. In the mouth is a lot of mucus and that mucus can trap microbes. And also, there are more microorganisms in your mouth than people that live on planet Earth. That's incredible. There's a different community at the back here to this one community here and this community there. And to, to create a proper balance in the microbes that in your, in your mouth, it's being fully hydrated, eating a plant-based diet, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar, <laughs> because the sugar also feeds the microbes that are living in the mouth, that can, the pathogenic ones, that can start eating away at the enamel on your teeth, and no one likes the dentist. But there is a simple thing you can do to maintain a proper balance in the, in the mouth, and that is oil pulling. That's taking a spoonful of coconut oil and swishing. Swish, 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 and after about 10 minutes, spit it out. Don't spit it down the plug hole because the coconut oil will go solid and plug up your drain. Spit it outside and the microbes that live on the soil will eat up the waste in your coconut oil as you spit it out. Also, rinse your mouth a couple of times with water. That's a great way to maintain a proper balance in the microbes in your mouth. Now, as you swallow, then the food comes down into your gastrointestinal tract. And do you know that you have a secret weapon in your gastrointestinal tract? And on Friday night, I'll be talking about it more. It's called hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, it's, if it's in good amounts, it will, it's one of its designs is to kill off any microbes that come in, maybe a bit of bacteria or a bit of fungi or yeast might come in on the food and you can't see it because they're microscopy. If you've got good hydrochloric acid, it will kill it. And yet people that are on antacids, what, what is their hydrochloric acid levels like? Gone. <laughs> and people that do long-term antacid use, they're finding that they're becoming susceptible to colon cancer because the food's not getting broken down in the stomach because they've lost their acid. And so further on down, those enzymes can't break it down because it didn't get an initial breakdown. And so then it gets all the way to the colon and bacteria has to be created to try and break down these partially digested foods. And that bacteria has the ability to start eating away at the colon wall. Now, if I lost you there, that's all right, because on Friday night, we're going to take the whole journey through the gastrointestinal tract. Message is, um, antacids aren't very good. It defies reason. How, how are you going to break your food down now if you're taking antacids? So some people say, well, I've got too much acid. And I say, how do you know? Well, it keeps coming up. Well, the problem's not the acid. The problem's the gait. So what's the gait? The gait is the cardiac sphincter, which is a muscle. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. When it tightens, it opens. Magnesium will relax and close that, that little uh, muscle there. So the body's secret weapon is hydrochloric acid. Do you know hydrochloric acid is part of your immune system? Because it's designed to kill off any harmful bacteria that might come in on your food. Do you know what this means? The only people that get food poisoning are people with low hydrochloric acid. Because <laughs> if everyone's hydrochloric acid levels were high, then it would, it would wipe out any microbes that come through. Hydrochloric acid also uh, unites with uh, pepsinogen to create, to produce pepsin that breaks down your prote protein. Now, if you got a little bit lost there, it's all right, Friday night's coming, where I'll explain it all in a little bit more detail. And then the food breaks down to tiny little particles and gets into the blood. Now, in the blood, we have white blood cells, and basically that's officially your immune system. And we have five different types of white blood cells. 
we have got neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most common white blood cell and about 66% of our white bloods is neutrophils. We've got monocytes. They are another type of white blood cell and they make up about 15%. Lymphocytes are a white blood cell that are made in your lymph nodes, so in your lymphatic system. The other ones are made in your bone marrow. Basophils and eosinophils, they just make up a very small amount of your white blood cell. Your lymphocytes are your scouts. So they, they zoom all around the blood looking for any harmful pathogens. And if they find them, they say, hey guys, especially neutrophils and monocytes, we've got some problems here that need to be wiped out. And so these two come along, they're basically your internal armour and they start to wipe it out. Now if you've got a cut and you rub a bit of manure in it, well guess what's going to happen very soon? It's going to all swell up and your white blood cells are going to come to the area and as they die off it's called pus. That's what pus is. <laughs> they're your dead white blood cells. They do a wonderful job. So you see, they're in your body to protect your body. They're your internal army. They're your immune system. My sister's a senior science teacher, and when she taught her high school students uh, about the white blood cells, when she ended it, she said, students, your body's designed to heal itself. The blood has everything you need. Tomorrow, in, in the morning, we're going to be doing hydrotherapy, which is water therapy. And whenever a person has an injury in an area, the blood tends to sit and pull. Well, when you do hot and cold treatments to the area, then the more blood comes in, more blood means more white blood cells, and the old blood is flushed out, which has got the waste in it, because that's what blood does. Blood not only brings uh, nutrition, oxygen and water and white blood cells, but also it carries away the waste. It's quite an amazing system. But your vacuum cleaner system basically is your lymphatic system. And that's where that little lymphocyzer jumping up and down, remember people get old because they stop jumping, people get sick because they stop jumping, we've got to start jumping. I'm pretty sure that the sports show, has it already sold out of rebounders? Have you got your rebounder yet? Or maybe you got the name of a good brand and you're just going to go to eBay. <laughs> but it's a very important part of, uh, of getting healthy is stimulating that lymphatic system. So your lymphatic system is all also part of your immune system because it's the cleanup team in the body. And, and what your lymphatic system has, it has all these little gates. And it's only when you move that they open. But with the lymphocyzer, they're all opened on the top of your bounce, close on the bottom, open on the top. And basically that, that sets up a, uh, a, like a, a pumping system that pumps the waste out, dumps it into the bloodstream. And if there's anything nasty, these guys will wipe it out. But first of all, it goes to your lymph nodes where you've got your lymphocytes and they can wipe them out. It's an amazing system. Let me give you an illustration of uh, a little boy that I helped. His mother came to see me and I noticed the little boy's finger was twice the size. And it was all red and it had white pus sitting on top. It was sort of had a skin over it. And I said, whoa, what's happened to that finger? And the mother said, it's um, cellulitis. That's what the doctor said. Do you know what cellulitis is? Inflammation of the cell. Well, it's not rocket science, is it? We can see that that's inflamed. I said, what are you doing? She said, he's on his second course of antibiotics. What would this be after a week and a half? If I don't think it could have looked much worse. In other words, is it doing anything? And she said, at the moment, he's on um, painkillers and sleeping tablets. <laughs> and he's seven. I said, um, <clears throat> can I try something? She said, please. So what I did was I got two um, mugs of water, one hot and one had cold with ice cubes in it. And we put it in the hot for three minutes. And we put it in the cold for 30 seconds. Now when you're a little bit cool and you get in a hot bath, you feel a tingling, don't you? That You see hot, 
st stimulates, the hot water. Water is the best conductor of hot and cold. That's why your hot water stimulates. That's why you feel that tingling. And then you lie down in the bath and after about three minutes, what's happening? Ah, and you could just about go to sleep. So you see, hot initially stimulates and then it slows down. Now before it's got time to slow down, we put the finger in the cold water. What does cold do? <gasps> Wakes you up. So cold stimulates too. But it only takes 30 seconds before everything slowed down. The reason so many people died when the Titanic went down is the body just actually slowed down so much the body stopped in the cold water. They died of hypothermia. Everything just stopped. We're warm-blooded creatures. That's why we don't like the cold. But it's all right, it's a wonderful tonic and it's not going to kill you. Then we go back to the hot. And before it's got time to slow down, what do we do? Back to the cold, back to the hot. We do it three times. Now by the, by the end of the three times, a big smile came to that little boy's face. What was the smile? He's got relief. What did that do? Going in hot and cold, drew massive amounts of blood, massive amounts of blood with the neutrophils and the monocytes and the lymphocytes and the basophils and the eosinophils, your army going in there, and the oxygen and the water and the nutrition. And as new blood goes in, what happens to the old blood? It's pushed out. And in 15 minutes, that boy's pain had reduced by 50%. That's quicker than Panadol. And then we put a grated potato poultice on it. And the whole rest of the time I was talking to the mother, the little boy's just looking at me smiling. For the first time in 10 days, he'd had some relief. What was his body saying to him? Yes. See, you watch your body's signs. His mother told me that when he got home, he said, can we do that again? <laughs> They did it again at two in the afternoon. They did it again before he went to bed. And when he woke up in the morning, the finger had gone right down. And when they took the poultice off, all the stuff came out. Mm -hmm. No need for antibiotics. No need for painkillers. No need for, for sleeping tablets. So simple. It's just so simple. That's what I love about it. Isn't that what, what, isn't that what God meant? It to be, we've made it too complicated. It's very simple. What was the white? It was the dead white blood cells. They were doing their job, but we just need to help the body. The body can heal itself. What the hot and colds do is move blood and get more of your white blood cells into the area. The poultice has helped to take the waste off and, and, and it will heal. Won't he have a big hole there? Yep, that'll heal. The, the body heals itself. When, my, when I was in um, Queensland and I was a homeschool mum, they asked me to do a meeting at a homeschool camp and I called it the mother, the nurse. So I was giving it to a whole lot of mothers on how to treat their children naturally. And my son Peter was 13 at the time and he'd started the generator and it was a bit tough and it had flipped him back and he scraped his shin on a star post. He came down and it was all raw and I said, great. I said, Pete, if you agree, we're going to do nothing to that. Absolutely nothing. So what's going to happen? It's going to get all swollen and pussy and look really bad. And Pete's, yeah, you know, boys love their injuries. Love them. They're like trophies to them. You know, it's often difficult for us women to understand boys, but, you know, they're boys. I raised a whole lot of boys and they love it. That's why mothers never say, is that safe? Just turn the other way, right? <coughs> and if you don't let them, you know where they're going to get their kicks? On violent games. It's far better that they climb trees, fall out and break a leg and, you know, that it's a trophy. That will not harm them as much as trying to get their thrills on the video games. So Pete said, yeah, Mum, yep. Anyway, um, the next day, it's exactly what I hoped for. It was all swollen and red and had a big scab on it and it looked terrible. I said, great, Pete, great. This is going to be great for the meetings. See, I wanted the ladies to see that even something that bad, it's easy fixed. Well, half an hour before the meeting, Peter climbed a tree and knocked it. 
and he knocked the scab off and blood and pus went everywhere and he came running. He said, oh, sorry, Mum, look what I did. I said, great, that looks even worse. That's exactly what we want. <laughs> and, and so Pete, Pete's grinning, you know. As I said, boys love their scars. Anyway, uh, of course, I took him to the meeting and the women are going, ah! <laughs> I said, it's all right, doesn't matter. We just washed it with a bit of salt water and and then uh, put a grated potato polish on to get the swelling down. I said, even at any point, it's all right, it's all right, you, you, can, you can do it. The body was trying, but it just needed a little bit of help. And of course, that's what we can do to help it. So your white blood cells. Now there, is, there are some things that can boost those white blood cells, and there are some things that can inhibit or slow them down. So let's have a look at what does. Number one. Pure air. Pure air is about 21% oxygen. And oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. And the blood is carrying that oxygen. Do you know cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen? We've got to keep this body clean and running well so cancer can't get a hold on it. So make sure the air you're breathing is pure. Did you have your windows open last night in your bedrooms? Pardon? <laughs> put another blanket on, put a beanie on, but have that window open so you've got pure air. Number two, sunshine. Did you know that sunshine, I know there wasn't much today, but you had some good sunshine yesterday, didn't you? And the body stores sunshine well. The sun is the doctor in the sky, okay? It is not the enemy. And did you know that one of the causes of skin cancers is a vitamin D deficiency. Mm. Your, your face only needs 15 minutes a day. Don't put any creams or potions on it. Just let, let the sun come on your skin. So if that sun comes out, run out into it and take as much off as you dare so that the sun's on. The sun is a healer. It'll boost your white blood cells. Number three, there are some things that will kill off the white blood cells. One is refined sugar. It will kill off the white blood cells. There's a book called Proof Positive by Dr. Neil Nedley, and he actually gives a percentage of how many lollies kill how many white blood cells and how many white blood cells are killed off by a slice of cheesecake. And he defines it exactly. So keep away from the sugar. Also caffeine, caffeine can inhibit the proper production of the white blood cells and the hybridized wheat. Now the hybridized wheat does not kill off the white blood cells. The hybridized wheat stimulates an overproduction of eosinophils. So you can have a problem if you've got not enough white blood cells and you've got too many white blood cells. Now if you've got a cold you'll have a lot of white blood cells and that is good because they're fighting a cold. But when you get a particular white blood cell like the eosinophil in large amounts, the eosinophils are the histamine carriers. And histamine, when it's in high amounts, does everyone know what you get? allergies. And if someone has an allergy and they go to the doctor, what will he give them? Antihistamines. So too many eosinophils can cause allergies. Now at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I do live blood and analysis and I'd get a drop of blood and put it up on the screen. And these eosinophils, they light up like bright lights. Whereas these others don't, they're not like bright lights. Basophils is a bit bright lights too. Now on one drop of blood, there should be two eosinophils in that whole drop of blood. And if someone has a gluten sensitivity, I will see six eosinophils. And if someone has, so that's a sensitivity. If someone has a, that's to gluten. If someone has a gluten intolerance, I will see 8 to 10 eosinophils. That's an intolerance. 
And if someone has celiac, I will see 15 to 20, sometimes I've seen 23, that's celiac. One lady, I saw an intolerance in her blood because she had about 8 to 10 eosinophils. She said, um, oh no, I've had a test for celiac and I'm not celiac. I said, no, you're not celiac, but you're intolerant. The test will not show intolerance or sensitivity. And if someone is sensitive or intolerant and they keep eating the wheat, guess what they're going to get to? You're celiac. And if someone is celiac and they totally stop all wheat, they can bring themselves back to intolerance and even sensitivity. And they can get to the point where they can have a slice of bread, maybe once a month, <laughs> and not get a reaction. One lady said, since I've stopped the wheat, I don't have a cat allergy anymore. Another lady said, since I've stopped the wheat, I don't have a horse allergy anymore. Another lady said, since I've stopped the wheat, I don't have a dust allergy. Another lady said, I don't have the pollen allergy anymore. Oh, it's much easier to blame the cat and the horse and the dust and the pollen than the wheat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you can see why, because when we have an intolerance to it, it increases the eosinophils, which increases the histamine carriers, and there's your allergies. Aha. Uh -huh. Just push the button. Stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. So those things must stop. So the dairy, there, as I said earlier, about 60% of Australians, it says, are intolerant to dairy. How can we boost the immune system? Number four is sleep between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. They're the hours of power. That's when your batteries are re being recharged. That's when your immune system is getting a boost. How many people are prevented from sleeping in those hours because of technology? The most dangerous time to allow your eyes to be exposed to the screens are in those hours. There must be some rules in the home for the children, for the teenagers, for the adults. I've got study to do. We'll go to bed at 7.30 and get up at 3. You can do it then. Get up at 4. You can do it then. Number five, exercise. The high intensity interval training increases blood supply to the bones and it's in your bone marrow where your where your white blood cells are made, except for your lymphocytes, they're made in your lymphatic system. And so ideally some of your high intensity should be rebounding. We've got to start jumping. The kids know what to do. Rebound er. It's one of the best investments that you can make. Three minutes twice a day, how's that? Every office should have one. Staff are getting a bit tired, get them on the rebound there. Number six is proper diet. And we just covered the proper diet. High fibre, they're the three essentials, is fibre, protein and fats. One of the questions was, there is a doctor that says, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. But I've known people on fat-free diets and they're very large. Do you know, really, it's, it's the fat you eat isn't the fat you wear because fat doesn't make you fat. It's the wheat and the sugar you eat. <laughs> that's your wheat belly. That's where it dumps. That's basic anatomy and physiology. Especially your saturated fats. Do you know what your body loves doing with saturated fats? And the best saturated fats is your coconut. Burns it as fuel. It's like the farmer. The Australian farmer who got coconuts cheap to fatten up his cows. 
Well, his cows lost fat, put on muscle, started bounding round the paddocks. So if you want to bound round the paddock, what do you eat? <laughs> the coconut. Number seven is use of water. To keep that blood thin, to enable your body to make your white blood cells, we must be drinking water. And ideally, at least two litres a day. And to get that water into the cell, the whole salt. <coughs> Crystal of the whole salt. Ideally Celtic in Himalayan. But one of the most powerful immune system boosters is this system here, is the hot and colds. So what I'm suggesting is after your hot shower, you have a quick cold. Now you can have a 10 minute hot shower and a 10 seconds cold. Aren't you glad I didn't say 10 minutes cold and 10 seconds hot? It's all relative, isn't it? And if you go like this, <gasps> don't worry about that. Cold is an excellent tonic. Every morning at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I do my high intensity exercise, running up the hills, walking down them, running up. As I said this morning, the hat came off, the gloves came off, my little down jacket came off and tied around my waist. The whole body warms up and I really missed diving in my mountain stream this morning. <coughs> so even in the middle of winter, I dive in my mountain stream and it's, it's one of the most powerful immune system boosters, that quick cold. Now because it's quick, it gives a rush to the body and it basically stimulates the bone marrow to make more white blood cells. I have worked out in the middle of winter that I can be in and out of the creek in seven seconds and then the deep cold, the pain doesn't kick in because you don't get cold. And when you have your quick shower, now I don't have a quick cold before I go to bed because I don't want to wake up. <laughs> but in the morning I do. You see, most people get winter colds and flus because they don't use cold. So how do you use cold to prevent winter colds and flus? You make sure you're breathing in some fresh air every night in that little bit of a window open. You make sure you're outside every morning in the cool air doing the exercise. Make sure you're warm. I had gloves and my down jacket on and my woolen leggings and a little head thing. Make sure you're warm, but make sure you're breathing in that fresh air. And remember, 3,600 mil of air in, 3,600 mil out when you're starting to breathe deeply. So use that cold. And then when you come back, have your hot shower. That's very nice. And end with quick cold. Ending with quick cold equalizes the circulation and prevents chilling. You have a hot shower and then go and stand out in that cool air, you will chill. You have a hot shower, have a quick 10 seconds cold and then go out in that cool air, you will not chill. What cold does is it equalizes the circulation, prevents chilling, closes the pores. So we have a steam bath at Misty Mountain and at the end of the day, everyone has a steam bath. They're in the hot steam for about 10 minutes, then they dive in the mountain pool and they come back into the steam bath and they do that three times. And if a lady says, I don't want to do the cold, I said, we well, don't have to do the creek. There's a cold shower there. She said, I don't want to do that. I said, well, I'm sorry you can't because the hot treatment will cause you to faint. It'll cause you to be sick. <laughs> The only time we've had someone faint in the steam bath is she wasn't drinking enough water and instead of diving in the creek she just stood out in the cool air <laughs> and then went back into the steam bath. In fact she just slowly fainted and put her head on the staff's shoulder and it was young Jessie, she's only 22 and she was saying, Howard, help! <laughs> Howard ran in and the ladies. And that's when I, when I investigated I found out that 
she wasn't having the cold. So if you don't have the cold, you really, in fact, you really shouldn't have a hot shower unless you have the quick cold. Again at night, the hot shower, I'll have a hot shower tonight and it'll warm me up and relax me and I'll slip straight into bed and I'll sleep very well because the hot shower relaxes you. But in the morning, if I have a hot shower, I have that quick cold. Remember, it's just quick and don't worry about this. <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's not, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it'll uh, wake you up. So in the winter, when I'm diving in that creek every morning, there have been times when the cold has gone round everyone and I don't get it. <laughs> they say, why aren't you getting it? I said, you've got to dive in the creek. We don't want to dive in the creek. We don't want to have a cold shower because we're warm-blooded creatures. And when cold water touches us, the body says, oh no, enemy! Because if we stay in that cold water, we can actually die. And because the body sees the cold as an enemy, it starts to move and it starts to move very, very fast. And it's that reaction, hap that reaction effect that has such a dramatic effect on the body. It stimulates the lymphatic system, it stimulates the blood system, it stimulates the bone marrow to make more red and white blood cells. It's an incredible tonic. And all through Europe, hydrotherapy has been used for centuries. And as you can see in that sore finger, you can't wait now to get a sore finger, eh? And try those hot and coals. And in detail tomorrow, I'm going to show you some specific hydrotherapy treatments. So one of the best immune system boosters is the quick cold after a hot shower. The good news is there is no need to get a flu shot. My husband met a doctor and the doctor said to him, my eyes have been opened because of an experience I had. And my husband said, what was that? He's a doctor in the North Shore in Sydney. He's about 48. He said, well, recently a lady came in and said, um, Oh, he said to her, are you ready for your flu shot? And she said, I'm not going to have that. He said, why not? She said, that stuff's toxic. He said, no, it's not. Look at this. And he injected himself. <laughs> she said, well, I'm still not having it and left. He went home and he told his wife and she said, are you stupid? <laughs> she said, that stuff's toxic. He said, well, how come I don't know? He said, two months he was sick. Two months he was sick. So then he began to investigate and he was surprised. He had no idea what was in it. You see, if the body's designed to heal itself, you, you don't need to have the flu shot. Mm -hmm. These are the best immunisation against winter colds and flus. And the last, these are called the Eight Laws of Health. And the book that uh, Tim showed you, The Ministry of Healing, there's a chapter in there called The Physician and Educator and on about the second page of that it lists the eight laws of health which I, I have listed here. They're the eight doctors and the last one is trust in divine power. Did you know that worry, anxiety and stress has a devastating effect on the immune system? And there's a beautiful verse, it's in... Uh, Isaiah 26 verse 3 it says thou will keep him in perfect peace he whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee that's a lovely verse if you're worried trust in God he he will bring you through he is never he has never failed in fact he's never lost a case so he's the one to have faith in I believe that medicine many times is based on fear Whereas natural medicine is based on faith. Faith is in an incredible body that's been designed to heal itself. And faith in God, who brought you here tonight <laughs> so that you could understand more about the body you live in and the conditions to give it for healing. Now, I also don't see any expensive um, supplements there, do you? It's cheaper than we think.
and it's easier than we think. Now I have a whole pile of questions here. So I will spend this little bit of a time. Some of them um, I've answered. Is barley hydrolyzed, hydro, um, it says hydrolyzed, Hi has it been um, hybridized? No, it hasn't. What is gluten-free flour? Well, gluten-free flour is often a combination of rice, potato flour, corn flour, so you can have a look. So, and the next one is, what about homemade muesli? Is homemade muesli okay? And there's another question, what about oats? If someone is celiac, they can't usually handle oats. But often gluten intolerance and sensitive can handle oats. Now, it, it has a totally different gluten structure to what you find in wheat. So I leave oats to you. Some can handle it, some can't. But it needs to be cooked because cooking breaks down the starch in the grain. Eating raw oats basically is indigestible. So if you have muesli, it should be have a slow dry bake. We do a muesli and we soak buckwheat and then we put it in the dehydrator and then we mix it with nuts and seeds and coconut and that makes a very nice muesli. Um, what's it say? Let's see, is oats, oat, um, I made muesli okay with soy milk or nut milk and fruit, no sugar, yep, sounds fine as long as the muesli's been cooked. What do you have for breakfast? <laughs> I told you about my breakfast this morning. This is what I usually have for breakfast. I usually have pawpaw or I have um, grapefruit, I love them both. I have chia seeds and then we have a local bakery, German bakery, that does a sourdough spelt toast and we have a slice of that. I put olive oil and cayenne pepper and avocado on my bread. My husband puts uh, just avocados on his. And then we have either black eyed beans or we have red lentils or we have brown lentils or we have scrambled tofu. That's what I usually have for breakfast. This morning, as I mentioned earlier, I had blueberries and I had a very nice, like a roti, a flat, flat chapati, and I had a very nice dal. That's what I had this morning. What do you mean by breakfast as a king? Well, I just told you breakfast like a king. Now, for some people, they're not interested really in legumes for breakfast. So another excellent breakfast might be some fruit. If you're a diabetic, you're best to go for grapefruit. Don't like grapefruit, go for your berries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, and millet. Millet makes a delicious porridge. Now, it takes about 40 minutes to cook millet, so you might do it in a slow cooker. Or you might get up, put it on, and then go outside and run up and down hills, come back, have your cold and hot shower, then the millet is ready. And the millet's very nice with a bit of stewed apple on it with say some coconut cream on it, with some cut up fruit on it and sprinkle ground linseed all over it and have some nuts. So there's another good one. Okay, Barbara, can you please let me know what you have for breakfast, lunch and dinner? We just did that one. What you have and how to prepare the lentils. When I have lentils for breakfast, I usually just put olive oil, maybe some Italian herbs or some fresh thyme out of the garden and a little bit of oil. I keep it very simple at breakfast because I've got lots of children to pray for and I read, usually read my Bible and then I'm running up and down hills and diving in creeks so I try and keep breakfast very simple. In the back of my book there are a few recipes. I think I've got some of the basic recipes that I usually have. For lunch, I usually have always a big salad, maybe some cooked vegetables and usually something with legumes, like some of the recipes in my book. If I have dinner, what do I have? Ah, I might have a bowl of soup. If there's no soup, I might have an avocado. Um, it's usually night and light and sometimes I don't. Is goat's milk okay for a baby? Yes, goat's milk is okay for a baby because your little newborn goat is about the size of a little newborn human. Look at cows. In the first year of life, they're nearly as big as their mothers and they're a bit dumb, aren't they? If you tried to shoe them through a, gar a, a gate. So if you want a baby that's a bit dumb and big and fat, what do you give them? <laughs> 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 
It says here that the cow's milk didn't agree. Cow's milk doesn't agree with many, but many babies have flourished on the goat's milk. <clears throat> Can someone who has a heart condition or a stroke take salt crystal with water? Yes, because it's mineralized salt. The salt in the supermarket is only two minerals, sodium chloride. That is what contributes to heart disease. That is what causes the problem. And I'll show you that in detail tomorrow. Doctors advise patients who've had a stroke, no salt. Do you know the doctor is absolutely right. There should be no table salt. But the mineralized salt is totally different. Would you be able to talk about uh, fertility on Friday night? I'm going to talk about fertility tomorrow night when I talk about hormones. So tomorrow night we can do that. Um, is it necessary to have a CPAP machine to assist with breathing through the night? All you have to do is stop the wheat dairy, sorry I'll push the button, wheat dairy refined sugar and, that, and you will easily lose weight, it's usually weight and also excess mucus in here. In fact it's like um, Bobby that I told you about, 45 kilos in weight he lost in uh, two and a half months and he said it's like I'm not even on a diet because I'm eating so well, that's the best diet. What's your view on antiperspirant deodorants with aluminium with it? Guess. <laughs> no, I don't think I've used a deodorant for about 30 years. Um, if you perspire a lot and you find that your body odour is not good, try going on this diet that I'm advising and you'll find your, col your colon will work better and you'll find your body odour will far improve. But for those that really need something, you can get a crystal and you can rub the crystal and you can get also natural deodorants. What is the best way to treat tinnitus? Hey, I'll just push the button. Stop the wheat, dairy and refined sugar because most tinnitus is due to excess mucus in the eustachian tubes. What causes excess mucus in the eustachian tubes? And the eustachian tubes, your ears, your nose, your eyes and your mouth, they're all connected. And that's actually what causes the tinnitus most of the times. Some people have tinnitus, one man had it because he used to be an explosive man and he heard a lot of loud noises so you know he's got buzzing in his ears and he'd sustained damage from being exposed to the loud noises. Sometimes people like um, rock singers, you know, they, they have it because just so very loud noise. Um, what are the free books today? All the free books are the little tiny books up the back. It says three free books. I think there's about 20 free, no, maybe 10 free books up there. All the little tiny books are the free books. How often should I do the high intensity interval training? Every day, every other day? I do it every day. It's so good. In fact, I read this in a, in a little book. It said, in a short time, you will so realize the benefits of pure air and oxygen, you wouldn't live about without these blessings. So I do it every day because I love the results. But if you're pushed for time and you do it really hard, you could probably get away with it um, every other day. Do you know, the Bible says, um, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. I hold fast to it because I love the results. Where does meat fit in? <laughs> well, if you want to know the truth on meat, the good book to read is um, uh, The China Study by Dr. Colin Campbell. He shows that 5% animal protein, it doesn't trigger cancer. What's 5% animal protein? That's about a tablespoon of meat a day. <laughs> I myself would prefer to eat vegetarian. Plus the meat today is in a pretty bad way. If you went to the abattoirs and saw what happened, you might not eat it again. I have an allergy to MSG. So um, can we help? Uh, actually, it gives, him an, it gives the person an anaphylactic shock and they need the EpiPen. Well, basically, you've just got to eat. The food you eat is, is what you make. And there are lots of shortcuts. So you've just got to be careful. I never eat MSG because everything I eat, I make. And there are lots of shortcuts. You know, you can make a nice dish and then freeze it into, into lots, you know. If a, if a person is living by themselves, they might only have to cook twice a week because they can freeze it and last it and just have lots of fresh fruit and veggies. 
Can someone who is suffering from MS and has excessive hair be able to walk? Can't hardly walk because of the pain. Um, MS can be turned around and one of the main causes of MS is uh, mercury. So if someone has mercury fillings in their mouth, they need to come out. Please keep away from fish. And then little by little that myelin sheath can be built up. And I'll be talking about that myelin sheath and the cell, the, the nerve cells on Saturday morning. And I have seen people walk again. But adhering to the lifestyle program that I'm suggesting can bring healing. And as you'll see on Saturday morning, coconut oil can, can heal brain cells. Um, what is the wheat change causing celiac disease also? Yes. Where does oats fit in? I think we answered that one. Uh, there's a Dr. John McDougall McDoug who says fats and oils you eat are the fats you wear. So we also looked at that one and I showed you also that the fat that builds up in our body is mostly from the high carbohydrate. Um, also, there's a doctor that says caffeine doesn't affect diabetes too. Is this correct? Uh, no. <laughs> caffeine causes an insulin response. That's basic anatomy and physiology. And so caffeine does contribute to diabetes. Uh, oh, back to the start. And I notice it's almost half past eight and I know everyone here is keen to be in bed by nine o'clock. <laughs> So good night everyone. <laughs>